Hello and welcome to episode number 14 of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll impact their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value if you're thinking about a career in music, if you're in music school now, a working musician yourself, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. This episode, however, diverges a bit from that format. And rather than a musician's perspective, we're getting insight from someone from one of the hardest working sectors in the performing arts, ballet dancers. I met my guest, Cadence Rollin, not through the arts network, but through online education. And as an aside, I enrolled in my first online program about a year ago, and my only regret is not doing it sooner. That first class was a year-long program in public administration and policy implementation. And to my knowledge, I was the only student from the performing arts in it. In contrast, however, my second class, the one where I met Cadence, was a three-month business course where the arts sector was, shall we say, well-represented. Some of the most effective parts of that course's design were the sections devoted to -to peer-to-peer learning through written answers. And of the few hundred in the cohort, there were people of different ages, nationalities, professional backgrounds, and maybe more importantly, varying levels of familiarity with the subject matter. Cadence, the 21-year-old former ballet dancer, had the clearest answers and some of the most obvious command of the material. So after the class was over, I knew it would be interesting to unpack her career and her transition from ballet to business, to economics, and to finance. Cadence's career change, as you'll hear, began well in advance of COVID. Her injury may have forced the timeline forward, but it was inevitable. Given the transitions that many artists and Americans are making because of the economic fallout of the pandemic, I thought her story might have particular resonance. Angela Duckworth, the University of Pennsylvania psychologist, who's probably best known for her book Grit, wrote about human motivation. Human beings all want three things. One is to be competent, one is to belong, and one is to be free. As in, to have choice, to not be told what to do, but to choose what to do. I think in Cadence's example, those three things are expressed through the exceptional skill to make it as a professional, the camaraderie of the training and the ballet company itself, and the choice to pursue dance as a passion and a profession, but also the choice to leave it. Violinists, like ballet dancers, start at a very young age, too. But we can plan on playing until Social Security and our pensions kick in, setting aside for the moment whether or not we should. But ballet dancers are racing against the clock. And I came away from this interview deeply impressed by Cadence's level-headedness around what can be a confusing and conflicted experience for many artists. In The War of Art, Stephen Pressfield writes, The professional loves her work. She is invested in it wholeheartedly, but she does not forget that the work is not her. Her artistic self contains many works and many performances. In talking about professional artists, Pressfield continues, We do not over-identify with our jobs. We may take pride in our work, we may stay late and come in on weekends, but we recognize that we are not our job descriptions. The amateur, on the other hand, over-identifies with his avocation, his artistic aspiration. The author's point is that the amateur identifies as a musician or a novelist or a painter, but doesn't actually produce the products of those trades. The professional, on the other hand, gets up and makes those things every day. It's not sentimental. It's literally your job. Operationally, though, and maybe in contrast to Pressfield's hypothetical novelist or painter, the professional performing artist becomes incredibly efficient at that process. In fact, he maybe knows no other way of life. In its repetition, and even with consistently excellent execution, that daily process can be a form of passivity. The industry and its artists are susceptible to being stuck in path dependence, hemmed in by tradition, past decisions, and the demands of a busy performance and rehearsal schedule. If the coronavirus is an accelerant to pre-existing trends, rather than something that is setting us on an entirely new path, 
Many working artists are now facing circumstances that we might have otherwise put off for another decade. And that's where Cadence's story is a lesson, I think. She's already into a second act at an age when classical musicians are barely beginning their first. Even controlling for the shorter careers of dancers, Cadence's clarity and her not over-identifying with the craft to the detriment of her future decision-making is rare, but replicable. Please enjoy this interview with Cadence Rollin. Cadence Rollin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, so we're recording this in early September, and most of the guests I've had on so far, we've talked about some of their adaptations and transitions to the health crisis specifically. But you started down a different path before that to business administration and economics before the health crisis struck. Uh, but I want to start with your last few years with the Sarasota Ballet. My work is like a six day a week job. You know, we, we grind out a different program every week. But I know ballets work on a different time frame. So I want you to tell me, give me your perspective on what, what the average work week is like in a professional ballet. So it's different for every company, of course, but I think in general, we also do, you know, a six day week. Um, during my time with the ballet, you know, we would have usually start around nine or 10 in the morning with like a daily uh, technique class, which is basically a dancer's time to like warm up and, you know, get ready for the day. And then after that, you would take a break, uh, maybe have some lunch, and then the rest of the day would be devoted to like rehearsals and prep for um, upcoming performances. And then on the weekends, if it happened to be like a show week, rehearsals would be cut a little bit short, and then you might have one or two performances um, spread throughout the day. And those could run until, you know, 10, 1030 at night. So. How long does a company prepare generally for a given production? Um, it's definitely different um, when you're in a professional company. The timeline for getting ready is much shorter than when you're in school, you know, like training and preparing for a performance. So I would say maybe about a month or two. And usually you're, you might overlap um, rehearsals for multiple performances. So you might be rehearsing for one that's, you know, like in October, and then you're also rehearsing for one that's, you know, in November. So you're juggling a bunch of different rehearsals for different shows. You know, when a lot of my guests and my peers, we've talked about that that switch from being in college and like training orchestras to the mm -hmm. pro job, that's one of the hardest things to balance actually is the shortened time frame. So how much shorter is it between preparing uh, a training production and a professional production? Yeah, in, uh, for training when you're in school, you typically only have maybe one or two major performances over the course of the year. So you would have, you know, several months of preparation for a performance like that. And like all of your time would be devoted to that one performance instead of, you know, split between multiple different ones. It's kind of like magic to me how you guys learn choreography. <laughs> and uh, so how does that process evolve? I mean, so, you know, it's, it's really interesting to hear you talk about how a part of the day is set aside for fundamentals, I guess, and basics. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything equivalent to that. I think we would benefit from it, actually, <laughs> to, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> But how does that process start? Like, so were you like on day one of, an, of preparing for new production, walk me through the, the, the arc of that process. Well, usually the professional company, they bring in like outside choreographers um, to stage, you know, each piece that we're doing. And you're definitely expected to pick things up very quickly in the professional company. So, you know, the choreographer will come in um, usually the director has already cast the dancers in the roles um, that they want them to perform in. And then the choreographer will basically, they may have like a video of a past production that they'll show you. And then they'll just like work their way from the beginning, you know, until the end of the choreography, teach the steps. There was one performance that we did, which was like an extremely short timeline where um, the choreographer had to teach us the ballet in like a span of like four days which is extremely short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, she would give us a lot of choreography all at once. And you just have to sort of, you know, memorize it, memorize it, you know, in combination with the music and then you know, go from there. And how was that different in the sense of, I mean, 
you're, you're committing to memory and committing to physical memory, these movements. Mm -hmm. In a compressed amount of time, though, uh, is there a different strategy to doing that? Or is it just willpower? <laughs> uh, it's pretty much a lot of willpower, I think. I mean, you definitely you go home and, you know, you know, when you're just relaxing at home, you know, you're constantly going over it in your head. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, if you can find the music on like YouTube or something, you'll be rehearsing it at home, you know, going over all the steps in your head. I don't know, after so many years of doing it, it just, it's kind of natural, I guess. Do you pick up your own way of learning choreography? So obviously start very young. I mean, is there a really prescribed way of practicing or do you kind of do it intuitively or learn it intuitively, I guess? Yeah, I think everyone kind of has their own way of going about it. I know that some of my fellow dancers, they like kept like journals and they would like write down, you know, the steps so that, you know, to help them remember it. Um, I never did any of that. I just, I found that the best way of going about it for me was just going home and like listening to the music and going through it that way. Is that because, you know, the, the, the rehearsal process is so hard on your body, I would imagine. Do dancers spend a lot of time in their heads going through, going through their... Yes, <laughs> very much. <laughs> is that something that you have to build up as kind of, as like a muscle? I mean, it's something we talk a lot about in classical music is mental practice. I don't think really very many people do it though. I think it's just the instrument under your chin. So mm -hmm. do you have to build up kind of like your imagination, your powers of concentration? Yeah, I definitely think so. I remember a few of my teachers referring you know, to the mind as its own sort of muscle that you have to like train and keep in practice. <laughs> so mm -hmm. was there any instruction on that? Um, not really. I mean, you start so young, it's kind of hard to, mm -hmm. you know, find exactly where that process happens. It just sort of develops so gradually that you don't really notice. <laughs> sure. Do most dancers have a similar timeline? Did most of you guys start around the same age and kind of come up to the same progression? I think, yeah, most, um, you know, serious dancers will start very young. Some as early as like two or three. I started when I was five. But then there's, you know, there's the exceptions where some dancers will start later, um, like around, you know, between 10 and 12. And they can still, you know, make it into the professional world if they... Mm -hmm. You know, work hard. We'll get to that. We'll get to the early training, yeah. though. I, I'm curious, <laughs> though, about going back a little bit to the choreographer. So tell me about how the, the dance company, the company dancers, uh, relate to a choreographer. What is that relationship like? Um, it has to be a very close relationship. They definitely, they get out on the floor with you and they demonstrate the steps themselves. You know, they show you where to go, you ask them questions, they respond. I feel like it's a very, you know, give and take sort of relationship. You're just trying to learn as much as you can from them. And they're trying to, you know, give you all the information that they have. Because they've performed these ballets, you know, many times themselves in their own careers. So that's just, you know, they're like a wealth of information. This is probably a stupid question. But are all choreographers former dancers? most are, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Because you now you need to have the subject matter expertise to be able to yeah. even communicate with. Yeah, yeah, sure. It makes sense. So is that role, are they kind of like coaches too? I mean, obviously they have an artistic vision, but are they, are they helping you with your technique as well? Yes, definitely. Um, because, uh, you know, several, there are several different styles, even within just ballet, there's, you know, Balanchine, there's the more Russian style, there's like English style. So, you know, they're there to make sure that the technique is also performed accurately um, mm -hmm. in the way it was intended. So, so you're, with these different styles, when you are auditioning for a company, are you kind of tested in these different styles? Are you, are you there to demonstrate that you can switch kind of seamlessly between these different techniques? Well, usually, you know, every company has their main, you know, style that they use. Not, there are not very many companies that do everything I would say. So it's kind of up to you to, you know, do your research and choose those companies that best fit the style that you've been trained in most of your life. You know, it is, it is good to have your versatility and to be able to, you know, switch to different styles, but it's, it's very hard for, to be like a master of all of them, I would say. Mm -hmm. So in that process of getting a job and preparing for a professional career, I mean, I know, well, I'm, actually, I don't know. I assume that part of the reason why 
there's like a standardized hairstyle and there is a standardized costume. Like there is some element of interchangeability of dancers. And I say this coming from someone that we all dress exactly the same too, right? <laughs> we go out on stage, we're supposed to kind of blend in together. So mm -hmm. are dancers rewarded or looked at for their own um, individuality or their own skills? Or is it more about, is this person fitting in exactly with the machine as a whole? I think it's part of both. Um, when you're in the main corps de ballet of a company, um, they want you to, you know, fit in with everybody else. They want to create that seamless look, you know, where everyone is moving in the same way, similar heights, um, a similar, just a similar look. Um, but then they also want you to express your, you know, your own artistry, your own individuality, especially if you're like promoted into like soloist and principal roles. Um, where you're, you know, the only one on stage and you really have to have your own character and personality and technique. So it's kind of a balancing act between the two, mm -hmm. I would say. How does, in a, particularly in a soloist role, when you look at uh, the great dancers and the people that you emulate or you emulated, um, mm -hmm. what are some of the ways that individuality manifests in a dancer? So like in a, in a, in a violinist, you know, someone would have a really big loud sound or they might have sort of an aggressive approach to playing or they might use a lot of different tone colors or something. What are the things you look for from, uh, from a professional standpoint? What, what shines through individually in a performer? I would say everyone sort of becomes known for their own specialty. I think some people have like, you know, really quick footwork or they're known for their big jumps or their mm -hmm. turns. Um, some people just have a lot of like stage presence, you know, it, you know, they might not have the most amazing technique, but they just, you know, they sort of fill the stage um, with, like personality could be like, you know, their timing or their phrasing to the music or something like that, or their way to just like adopt every role as their own. Do choreographers ever see uh, the dancers? So they, someone comes down to Sarasota and maybe they don't know everybody in the company and they see people, uh, take on a role, do they make changes based on the person, the way they're like their way, their body moves and their interpretation, or is it, or do you have to fit yourself into their choreography? Uh, 100%. I think there's, there's definitely room, um, to make it your own. I think everyone brings their own style to it. Um, there are definitely like for every performance, there's usually two to three casts. So, um, you get to see different dancers perform the same roles and there's, there's always a difference in how it's done between mm -hmm. different dancers. When you're auditioning for a group like that and you're preparing yourself for it. So when, when an orchestra, when orchestras have auditions, we play behind a screen. And so we're anonymized that way. And we play music across by ourselves. We play music across a spectrum of different techniques. So, we demonstrate expertise in every, every basically conceivable technique that's going to come up in our work, more mm -hmm. or less. Yeah. And I think on one hand, that makes perfect sense. You know, right? You want to be, if you're going to sit next to somebody for a long time, you want them to be able to play everything in the repertoire. Right. The flip side of that is it can make people not have a specialty. Do you, does the... Does the ballet training and the ballet career do 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 you feel box do you or did you or do you, some of your colleagues feel kind of boxed in by the constraints um, that the, the technique had? I mean, a lot of classical musicians would re really want to burst out of out of their uh, genre. Sometimes I wonder if there's something similar uh, in ballet dancers. Hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've personally felt that way too much. Um, I mean, within the ballet company, you're not, you know, just performing ballet either. We've, you know, you also do performances that are very dance style or jazz or things like that. So I feel like there's, oh, there's more opportunities that. to um, try out different styles, even if it's not what you're like focused in. So. Are those, I, did, I had no idea. That's really interesting to know. Yeah. So are those styles, do you feel that the company prioritizes them equally or is it obvious that classical ballet is what we're here to do and everything else kind of takes a little bit of a second seat to that? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Ballet is, is the number one for those companies. And then um, they also bring in the other styles just for something different. Usually um, there are, there are companies that, you know, primarily focus on, you know, the contemporary or, you know, different styles like that. But the Sarasota ballet is, um, ballet is the primary focus for sure. Do you think that your leadership 
saw those different styles. Now, obviously, there's probably looking to get different audiences, but mm-hmm. also, did it did it act as a form of professional development for you guys? Like you to come in and work on jazz or modern dance or something like that? Yeah, definitely. It's, you know, I think when most young dancers start out, you know, ballet is kind of the only thing that they, they see. And then later on, when they're introduced to these other styles, it can kind of be difficult to break away from like the bun head mentality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like I remember I wasn't the biggest fan of contemporary dance or things like that when I first started, but it's interesting to explore it, you know, mm-hmm. uh, once you get older, I think you gain a deeper appreciation for it. So <laughs> to use, the, the, I think you said bunhead. So, the, yes. are we, um, so do you guys see yourselves as a unit? Like does the Sarasota Opera Company dancers or, or your analog companies, is it, are you guys really close? I mean, you spend a lot of time together or is it a very kind of clinical professional relationship? No, they're, the dancers are very close. <laughs> yep, definitely. Great. And, it's like lifelong friends, I would say. And is it the kind of thing where you kind of know each other before you get there from just being out in the world? You know, like a lot of musicians of a, of a certain age range will know each other from high school or from festivals and things like that. Is there a similar um, network in, in dance? Yeah, they they definitely say that the dance world is small. Um, you wind up seeing a lot of familiar faces in auditions and across companies. Um, there were a few dancers at the Sarasota Ballet that were that came from my um, training studio as well. So I definitely feel that it is like that. And was that training studio in the in your hometown? Um, it was in uh, Fair uh, Falls Church, Virginia. Okay. So which is where I grew up. Yep. And did those, and were all those kids local too, or did they come in from elsewhere to join that program? Um, no, they were, they were local as well for this, mm-hmm. this school. Yeah. And so, so you guys went on to have a professional career at the same time. So, a few. Yep. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. I want to talk a little bit about the, the physical demands on a professional dancer. So um, orchestra musicians, we play these really awkward instruments and there's a certain amount of pain built into the career. Like a lot of, I would say a high percentage of people are playing with some kind of chronic pain, but I would imagine that is an absolute like fraction of a percent of what you guys are dealing with. So I'm curious how you treat your bodies. I mean, do you look at your body as an instrument that you're trying to get the most out of in the short amount of time, or is it something you guys spend a lot of time thinking about in terms of, preventative uh, care and preventive prevention of injuries? Yeah, I definitely, we do think of it as an instrument, um, but it's one that, you know, has to last you for the rest of your life. So um, as much as possible, preventative care is, you know, what you strive for. Um, But I know that, you know, most of the dancers I was dancing with, all of them, you know, had aches and pains and, you know, issues that would flare up throughout the season. So does the institution support you guys in that sense like is there is there are there are there are there medical professionals within the rank not within the ranks of dancers but with the, on staff do people are there someone they're always there to kind of put you back together or say you need to sit this one out or something like that i think um some of the larger ballet companies have um you know a larger uh staff of like physical therapists and medical professionals um Sarasota Ballet didn't have as much of that, but they they did have, you know, like a massage therapist and physical therapist that you could sign up for um, if you needed, you know, help with any injuries or recurring issues. I just wonder if the if the shortened time frame of being a dancer, I mean, it's it's obviously the, the analog I'm sure that's always made is with the professional athletes. Um, that you have to squeeze in a lot of effort into a short amount of time. And I wonder how that affects your decision-making. So in the sense that like when I was younger and early in my career, I said yes to a lot of things that probably didn't have a lot of value, but they were important experiences at the time. And, and certainly like, you know, you take whatever opportunities you get. Does the does a ballet dancer in early in their career, and even as they get in um, more into their career, do you find that you have to take a lot of opportunities just to sift out what might be a value, or do you have to really learn how to say no, maybe because of the physical strain? Yeah, I feel like I feel like dancers do have a tendency to say yes to as many 
you know, opportunities as they can get just simply because it's such a competitive um, industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can go and audition for, you know, like a dozen companies and only get, you know, an offer from like one or two if you're lucky. So I feel like it, it's, there's a lot of pressure to like push yourself as much as possible mm -hmm. just to make sure that those opportunities don't slip away. So in years where there isn't a global pandemic, do, does every company more or less have like an audition season? So like, yes. and, and, and how does yeah. that work? So you, you said you take like maybe a dozen auditions in the course of, uh, in the course of a year. Yeah. So usually audition season happens in the winter to spring. Um, and so, you know, a company will put up a post on their website uh, asking for dancers and usually these auditions are held in like major cities, like, you know, New York city. Um, so you'll, you know, take the train up or, you know, fly up or whatever transportation you need. And you'll go to this, uh, cattle call audition mm -hmm. is what they call them mm -hmm. with, you know, hundreds of other dancers. Um, they'll give you a number, you know, to pin on, <laughs> and then you'll go into this room, um, and you'll take a technique class similar to what you do, you know, every day when you're part of a company. And then, you know, in between combinations, they'll make uh, cuts and uh, keep only a certain number of people uh, to continue through the rest of the class. And then at the end, you know, if you're lucky enough to be one of the remaining few, then they'll tell you in the next few weeks, we'll be sending out offers if we have any open positions. Interesting. So just so that I understand, is this one company holds an audition in, let's say, New York City or Chicago or Los Angeles, mm -hmm. or is it a like a, a, a conglomerate of I wish. different companies? Oh yeah, it's, I wish it was. It would be so much more convenient. But yeah, we, we, yeah. We're, we've been we've been trying the same thing in, in my business, yeah. which is well, we haven't tried it. We talk about it a lot, um, mm -hmm. trying to streamline the process because, right. you know, the way our the way my business works is you know, we all belong to a union and at the end of in each union paper that comes out each month, there's, there's basically a help wanted section and the orchestra's put in there who's looking for what and what it pays and how, how many weeks a year it is and so forth. And then you have to fly out to those places for mm -hmm. the audition. And, and that already is kind of a self-selecting process, right? So I had a teacher once say that like a lot of violinists are keeping the airlines in business, right? They're going to these <laughs> auditions with no chance of winning, right? They're not ready. They're not ready to win. They're not playing at a high enough level. Right. But the other part of it is, is how many people are kind of excluded from the process just because mm -hmm. the barrier is so steep economically. Is there anything yeah. like that? Any, are people talking about that in ballet? Yeah, definitely. I mean, audition season is, can get extremely expensive and you don't make very much as a dancer anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, if if we could, you know, consolidate all these auditions and streamline the process, it would make it much more accessible for mm -hmm. more people. How do dancers bargain uh, for contracts? How does that work? Well, when I was part of the Sarasota Ballet, I was in what was called the studio company, which is um, a lower level um, that is not part of the main, that is not part of the union. So I wasn't really um, a part of any, you know, company negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really know how that um works gotcha myself. and so tell me about uh nonprofit management in the ballet uh industry so what are the what are the challenges that are maybe unique to running uh, a ballet company well they do i mean they have the performances that they put on every year you know they require a lot of funding um because you have all these, you know, expensive sets and props and costumes and everything. Um, so they do take a lot of funds to put on. And then I feel like, I don't know, ballet is, it's not, you know, it's not for everyone. I feel like some people. Let me ask you, let me ask yeah. you this way. And is there a sense in the industry that there is a deficit of good managers in the ballet companies nationwide? I think, yeah, you could probably say that. Um, we'll get I, to it. We'll get yeah. to your business. So I'm, what I'm kind of get, what I'm trying to lead to a little bit actually yeah. though is, were you ever interested in that part of it? Like as you watched your company, as you watched other yeah. companies work and you said, maybe I could do this better or maybe we could do this better if we, if we changed X, Y, and Z. Were you ever curious about going into nonprofit management in particular going into managing a ballet company? Mm, I don't think I was really interested in, in doing that. Um, 
I think, you know, I was, I wanted to be a dancer. And I think in the back of my mind, you know, once I was done with the ballet career, I kind of wanted to get outside of the dance world. And, you know, I didn't want to be a choreographer. I didn't want to be a teacher. I wanted to, you know, expand into something completely new. Um, so I never really considered, you know, going into the, the back end of the <laughs> ballet. Sure. Yeah. And that's, I mean, <laughs> part company. of this podcast is about like the frontline workers. I exactly, yeah. um, I, I'm interested in that perspective. I'd, I'd be yeah. curious though, if you could um, illuminate a little bit why you weren't drawn or how you knew so clearly that you didn't mm -hmm. want to go into choreography or the other thing I hear about a lot of times is any kind of like fitness too. I know that dancers can kind of go into personal training and things like that. How did you know clearly that it was dancing? And then when that was done, you were onto <laughs> something else. Well, I mean, I was always very, um, you know, I cared a lot about my academics as well. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, the arts world and then the academic world are sort of like pulling in opposite directions. And I just, you know, the ballet world is, you know, very, it's very all consuming, I feel mm -hmm. like. And when you're inside of it, um, you kind of lose sight of what's outside of it. So, you know, you give everything that you have um, to the ballet world while you're in it. And then, you know, I wanted to, you know, get outside of that bubble and just try something new. <laughs> yeah, I hear you on that. You know, the, yeah. and I think it stems from, like you said before, the intensity of the competition mm -hmm. and that yeah. you have to be you have to be sharp and you have to be focused and you have to uh, like, you have to have continuity of effort and continuity of interest <laughs> on right. the thing. And at least in classical music uh, and maybe it's other kinds of music too, like fine arts probably in particular is that ironically it seems to breed this. There's no way I could say this without sounding pejorative and I don't really mean it to be that way, but yeah. it produces kind of incurious people you know, people mm -hmm. that aren't very curious about the world around them. And we're always trying, it seems like from their academic institutions to imbue the arts education with a little bit more liberal arts, but it never mm -hmm. really seems to stick. I wonder if you have any thoughts on, if it's just an unreconcilable thing, unreconcilable thing that, you know, we need to have specialists in ballet or the violin and, that if people are going to find literature and business and uh, other arts and things to be curious about, they'll, they'll find it on their own. Or do you think it can be imbued into the, into the education process from the beginning? I think it's probably more that people will find it on their own. I think mm -hmm. um, it's just sort of to strike the balance between, you know, it's the same as any other job. I feel like, you know, you have to have your career and then you have to, you know, establish the rest of your life besides that. And I feel like, the ballet world is, um, it just allows it to be too much, too consuming, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So tell me about, you said you got started when you were about five years old. I'm, I'm curious about how it came about that you started to be drawn to this, to this art form. I mean, was it the music? Was it the sets? Was it just the camaraderie? I mean, what, what was it about it at that young age? Maybe not five, but as you, as you progress a little bit that made you realize that, oh, this is something for me. And maybe I love this more than the kids around me. For me, it was just like the ability to focus on something and perfect it. Um, I just loved, um, you know, giving your all to something and just working so hard at it and then seeing the results at the end. And then the music, I think, you know, dancing to music, it still makes me so happy. Um, <laughs> I still dance around my house mm -hmm. like every day. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's what it was for me. At any point during your, your early formative years or even in the company, did you ever really lose touch with that, with that joy? I mean, was it, did it ever become just a job or did it ever become just an exercise? Um, towards the end there it did. And that was part of why I wanted to make the transition into something new. Um, yeah, I mean, it was always my passion and I always thought, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, but, you know, towards, you know, once I got the professional job, you know, I was like, I'm there, I've made it. But now, you know, it just sort of felt like a job. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Wasn't as much joy in it then. Yeah, I think a lot of us can, in, the, in any part of the industry can relate to that. But you yeah. switched careers because of an injury. So can you tell me about how that happened and what kind of injury that was? Yeah, so that um, happened at the end of my first season with the Sarasota Ballet. And um, 
I fractured uh, the fifth metatarsal in my foot during a rehearsal. It was literally like the last week of the season, right before our last performance. And I was like, so upset. Um, but it wound up being a good time to like, you know, step back and just like rest for the first time in years. You know, I'd been going nonstop, you know, with auditions and then going right into the company, rehearsals and performances. So I took that summer off um, and then went into my second season and I was still recovering from the injury. So I still wasn't feeling my best. And that was also part of um, what prompted me to, you know, explore other things. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what kind of student were you in high school or when you were a high school age? Like you said, you were um, interested in your, in your academics were very serious, but tell me about yeah. what you were interested in and, and tell me about that process. I was actually, um, I was homeschooled mm -hmm. all the way up and I only took a few classes at my local high school alongside the homeschooling. I was definitely, I was interested in, I was very good at history and um, English. I really liked to write and research um, and do things like that. And then as I approached um, college, I was looking for something, you know, that was flexible um, and practical that could be applied to many different career paths. Because at that point, you know, I still wasn't sure, you know, what I wanted to do um, besides dancing. So I thought that um, going into business administration and management would be a good choice. So how did you, so did you, you didn't go to college before the ballet company? I, um, I signed up for college classes um, in the same semester that I started my gotcha, professional sure. career. In conjunction, okay. Yeah. And so that was something that you thought seemed like a practical and pragmatic move. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously you've become quite adept at it. And uh, <laughs> you wrote some incredibly coherent and <laughs> explanatory <laughs> economics uh, answers that got, helped me get through this class that we shared, uh, that we shared some time in together. Um, what parts of this, though, as you've gotten more sophisticated in it, have, have resonated with you? I love economics. I never expected that I would. Um, yeah, tell me about that. Tell me why, yeah. that's, why it's so interesting and, and, why you, and why you've excelled at, excelled at it. Um, well, I just, I love the real world aspects of it. Um, the ability to test theories um, and see how they play out in the real world. I feel like it's so applicable to everyday life. Um, it's not just, you know, an abstract theory that you'll never use. Um, I feel like it's so useful for everyone to know. And you know, I just, I love like the probabilities. I love, you know, all the guesswork that comes with, you know, predicting you know, what will happen in the future. I love all that. It comes with history and all that. So that was what I loved about it. Were, you, were your parents who taught you in homeschooling? Yes, my mom. Being and, a homeschooler. Is your mom a professional educator? Uh, no, she's not. She actually, she just came up with the curriculum on her, on well, her I, own. <laughs> I asked because obviously you do ser very seriously and you said your brother's at MIT. Yeah. So you get these two high achievers come out of the homeschooling <laughs> system. Um, what, what is your brother studying? Um, aerospace engineering. <laughs> okay. <Yep. laughs> and uh, is there a, was there a sense when you were maybe 16, 17 that um, you were going to make it, you, you kind of had to make a similar choice. Like there was a divergent path for you to, to follow maybe uh, a top, top level academic education or go into dance or was it, or did you always have this plan to kind of try one and then split off later? Um, I think I always had the idea that I would, you know, give the ballet a try and then split off later. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. did you learn, learn these great study habits and this academic discipline um, in spite of or because of ballet training? I think it's in large part because of the ballet training. Um, it just, you know, gives you the sense of, you know, hard work and like focus and dedication. I mean, all the dancers that I grew up with, you know, were excellent students as well. Um, and I think it's just something that goes along with the with the nature that you have to have to be a ballerina. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And does it, it gives you kind of like a long time horizon, right? You're not thinking in short bursts if you're a ballet dancer. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yep. Was your brother involved in any kind of sports or arts? Um, he plays baseball. Um, he started, he was young as well. And he's played up through college. 
too. So, yeah. did he ever have any professional aspirations? Um, I think at one point he might have, but um, similar to me, he you know realized that he didn't want to make it a career, and he's you know interested in in other paths instead. Mm -hmm. It's more of a you know a fun pursuit for him now. Sure, of course. I was thinking about um, because it's it's it pretty improbable to become a professional baseball player, but it's also pretty <laughs> improbable to become a professional ballerina too. So I was wondering, did you have any kind of role models or proof of concept that this could be done? You know, because you, you obviously went to a good school. Were there, were there kids a little bit ahead of you that went, uh, went on and had this kind of career? Um, my training school, a handful of, of older dancers that did go off um, to companies before I did. So those were always inspiration, of course. Um, other than that, I, I don't know. I always just felt, you know, I have as good a shot as anyone, so I sure. should try. <laughs> well, sure. Then, then so uh, what about academics then? So my mother was a public school teacher, so I actually have like kind of the opposite maybe from you in that mm -hmm. very much a part of the school system. Right. So I'm curious about what kind of role models and you had from an academic perspective. Or was it just the demands, mm -hmm. like your mom set a very high standard and you lived up to that standard and then you were good to go? Yeah, I feel like that's, that's pretty much what it was. I mean, I don't think either of my parents, you know, were set on me and my brother going to top schools or anything like that. But, you know, they, they always encouraged us, to, you know, to pursue, you know, our dreams and our passions um, alongside good academics. So they were, they were very supportive of know the past that we decided to choose mm -hmm. so now that you're into this academic path and you're, you're a good way through your program what are some of the things that have surprised you about it I mean is it is it harder is it easier is it uh what part have things that have stuck out to you as being especially interesting things that you weren't interested in before you mentioned economics as being yeah. perhaps one you know, the best surprise of all is, you know, how well the online format works. Um, I mean, it's incredible what, you know, the Harvard Extension School has done. I mean, they've allowed, I mean, you can still do group projects with people, you know, from like halfway across the world. Mm -hmm. um, you're just meeting people from all walks of life, all ages, um, which is, you know, I think even slightly different from like an in person like on campus college um, because you have all different ages, you know, people in different careers. You get so many different perspectives that I don't think you would find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, are you, what are your predictions on the college experience going forward? Do you think that the online thing is here to stay irrespective of whether or not there's a vaccine in the next few months? Interesting. Um, I feel like for college at the very least, you know, the in-person aspect is necessary to some degree um, for many different majors. Um, and I feel like most people, you know, desire that at, you know, the college age, you know, this is your first chance for many people to, you know, go off and live on their own. Um, so I think the in-person aspect is, is probably a big factor um, mm -hmm. for most students. But at the same time, you know, I think virtual classes will also have a bigger presence um, because I think we've sort of proved now that they can be done. So that will yeah. also be an option, I think. <laughs> it's interesting to think like what preconceptions we had about anything, right. about music mm -hmm. making, about the arts, about travel, about uh, education that are all being upended, upended yeah. by this. Is your brother going back to school this year? I mean, is he going back to in-person classes? Um, he's also at home right now doing the online, online classes. And yeah. is, has MIT said they're not doing it until, are they going until like December or something, January, or, the, or is it the whole year as they closed? Um, I think they did allow, um, I think the seniors to go back for the fall, but um, they allowed people to opt out if they didn't want to go to campus. So my brother decided to stay home. And how's he day. feeling about it? Does he like, um, the, does he like the experience? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, he's disappointed because this would have been his senior year. Mm. So his last year on campus. But at the same time, you know, it's nice that he gets to spend it at home with us. Um, sure. We haven't seen him a lot <laughs> over the past couple of years. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, it has its ups and down, ups and downsides. Of course. But. All right. So tell me what you're interested in doing as you go forward. I'm curious about um, what aspirations and ambitions you have for your career now. Yeah. So right now, 
I'm very interested in wedding and event planning. Um, so I'm hoping to either uh, join like some company, some corporation as part of their like event management team, um, like a, you know, a hotel or, um, you know, like a sports team even, or um, another thing that I've been considering is opening my own uh, business as an event planner. So I've been uh, playing around with some ideas about that this summer, this fall. What's your intuition about how COVID and the technology might disrupt the event planning business? Yeah, so yeah, in-person events are kind of at a standstill at the moment. Um, but um, there's always the, uh, the field of virtual events, which I know a lot of, you know, planners in the industry are, are trying to tap into. They're offering, you know, virtual services and consultations, um, setting up, you know, virtual meetings and things like that. And they're also doing, you know, like micro events. So for, you know, very small groups of people um, at the moment. Mm -hmm. What about the event planning is so attractive to you? Um, well, when I was dancing at the Sarasota Ballet, I also um, wound up interning for a wedding planner in the Sarasota area. So I was kind of, you know, experiencing the two simultaneously. And what I found is that, you know, wedding and event planning is also an extremely creative field. Um, in fact, the, the wonderful lady that I interned for was a choreographer and former dancer herself. So wow. <laughs> that was an interesting connection. Um, so I just, I loved the combination of, you know, like the technical planning and organization, as well as the, you know, the creative whimsical design element. It just seemed to like, you know, hit all the boxes. <laughs> was that relationship with the, that woman um, that you interned for, was that just coincidence or did you? It was. Okay, wow. yep. <laughs> so tell me about when you say that it, you, it sparks um, your creative flow do you find it in some way that it's actually more creative than being in the arts? I don't know if I would say, well, maybe in a way, maybe because, you know, you're working with all these individual clients who have, you know, their own visions mm -hmm. and their own tastes and styles. So I feel like, you know, you get to experience all these different people's, you know, their, their, every, everyone's own vision um, rather than, you know, performing the same performances over and over again. Yeah. Um, I feel like you get a taste of so much more. <laughs> That's what I was kind of getting. There was a, yeah. I don't remember who, I think it was a director of a major opera company in San Francisco. So probably San Francisco opera. <laughs> and now, because now I think about, as I tell the story, it's coming back to me. Uh, he said something like he went and had a meeting in, with a company in Silicon Valley and having probably a fundraising call, but sitting over the conference table, talking to these guys and gals and leaving saying to himself, man, I wish I worked for a creative company and then <laughs> stopped himself in mid-track and said, oh my I God, I, but I do, I do work. I actually literally work in the arts, but I think it kind of ties back a little bit to what you were saying about sometimes the work becoming kind of routine mm -hmm. and especially when there's a big schedule and planned way in advance. I know right. that as a frontline person myself that I do miss that I have to really go out of my way to make uh, a connection with audiences and, and work with people directly because it's not a part of the job. And I think that's what you're saying actually is that it's exciting is that it's just working with people and solving their problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that something that you see as being like one of the features of this work is the getting to work with individuals? Definitely. I think so. It's not only are you working with, you know, the clients, but you're working with all the different uh, vendors that also come in to, you know, create the, you know, the production, basically. Um, you know, you have like the floral designers, you have, you know, the caterers and the uh, photographers and, you know, music. So you're working with all these different creative minds, you know, to create one vision, basically. So I think that's definitely one of the assets of the job. And I would imagine it never gets, I never, I imagine you never repeat yourself. I would no, imagine. Yeah. That, that's, that's the wonderful yeah. part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, because that's what something that people, I think it's hard to understand about working for major arts organizations is that so much repetition. Mm -hmm. um, yep. <laughs> so tell me about, you, you mentioned that you were interested in finance. So tell me about what that means to you. Like what aspect of finance are you interested in? How might that come into your future work? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, some of the classes that I took at the Harvard Extension School, um, we're in like, you know, capital markets and investments. Um, 
So I'm definitely interested in like maybe investment banking or something like that, um, as well as like stock market, uh, things like that. So uh, and actually Charlotte is, you know, one of the banking, mm-hmm. you know, hubs of the country. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the reasons that I was interested in, in moving here from Florida was um, the potential for jobs in the banking sector. How much, how, how much you explore that? I mean, if you were going to go about making a move into high finance, how would you do that? Um, well, I was looking at some summer internships for next year, mm-hmm. um, you know, with Wells Fargo or any number of those companies, just to, you know, check it out and see what it's like um, before I, you know, make the decision to go into event planning, you know, full time, you know, just try out some different, some different avenues. Yeah, my wife is a former violinist, and she had a great career um, playing great orchestras all across Europe and North America. And uh, a couple of years ago, she resigned a great, great position because she was interested in finance too. So, oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so she she worked for it as a CFP briefly. It wasn't her thing. I think she enjoyed yeah. the people work, but it was a little too repetitive. I was actually maybe a bit too much like the violin job. Oh. Um, but yeah, so for the right kind of temperament and the person that likes organization, like you clearly do, it's mm-hmm. a really, really interesting fit. Do you, do your former colleagues think you're a little crazy for doing all this? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Um, so many dancers that I knew at the Sarasota Ballet have also, uh, you know, moved on from the mm-hmm. dance world and are, you know, trying different things. So I feel like they're very open to their colleagues trying new things and, you know, experimenting because they, you know, everyone understands how hard the, you know, the ballet is. So I think they're very supportive of trying different things. To your knowledge, has the ballet found some way to adapt um, for next season or for this coming season? I think many companies are doing virtual seasons. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to do that instead. Um, But yeah, it's very, it's very tough you know, transition because in order to, you know, put on these productions, you know, the dancers have to be in very close contact and mm-hmm. it's just a hard, hard situation to deal with. Yeah. We're going back to work um, um, in two weeks for the first time since March. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we're going to be tested the week before every concert and we're going to do all virtual. All virtual. Yeah. yeah. And I saw that some ballet companies are coming back too. Um, in terms of in terms of events, live events in North Carolina, what's the timeline on that? Well, I talked to um, uh, the lady that I interned in with in Florida. You know, she was saying that you know events have been pushed back till next year. You know, she might not have anything until April or May of next year at least. So it's probably fairly similar up here. Um, it's kind of hard to say <laughs> what the timeline would be. It is. It's a, it's a very strange time. Um, I think it's been, I mean, if you can't, there's no way one can discount the economic loss and yeah. more importantly, the loss of life. I mean, it's absolutely staggering, yeah. but I think it has been good for some individuals in terms of accelerating, uh, accelerating change. And I'm optimistic that at least in the arts, you know, that we will um, come out of this weakened, undoubtedly economically, but I'm hoping that we can build back with an eye on more inclusion and more Mm -hmm. accessibility. And uh, I think that's, my my hope is that that actually transcends all businesses and all parts of American life is that, you know, they function a little better. Yeah, I think 2020 will be kind of a turning point for, a lot of different companies and people. Are you hearing anything like that? I mean, in terms of um, people that are close to you or people that you're observing, um, kind of accelerated positive change? And I feel like it definitely is a time for you know, people to step back and like, you know, explore some things that they didn't have time to before. It's sort of a time for everyone to like slow down and sort out their priorities and figure mm-hmm. out, you know, what really matters. Um, I know some friends who have, you know, like started, you know, their own online videos or like fitness training programs and Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, You know, it's just like finding ways to get involved, you know, like making face masks. Um, I feel like a lot of people that I know have been putting the time to, 
to new uses. What about in your college classes? So the, all these folks you're meeting around the world, are a lot of them doing this because they've been motivated because of the economy or because of having a little bit of extra time or uh, just circumstances around the health crisis? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for everyone to like, you know, learn some new things and take some new classes. And I know we've had some discussions in some of my recent classes about, you know, how everyone's been dealing with the situation and, you know, everyone's just been very supportive and, you know, offering tips of, you know, how to make things easier. And so definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, on that note, Kate, so I think it's a good place to wrap up. But before we go, do you have any recommendations on great things to read, watch, listen to, anything like that? Um, let's see. I usually use, you know, YouTube for all of my music. Um, if I want to listen to like ballet class recordings, uh, Stephen Mitchell is like my favorite um, ballet class pianist. I love piano music, so I'm always listening okay. to his work. Um, and right now I'm actually... Um, taking a, another course through um, a company called the Firefly Method, which is um, all about starting your own wedding and event planning business. So um, they have a lot of wonderful resources and uh, they also have a YouTube channel. So that's very helpful for anyone who's, you know, thinking of going into that industry. I'd highly recommend that. Okay, I'll link to those. Well, yeah. thank you very much for making time, Kate. It was great talking with thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. The music on the show, as always, is by Craig Wagner, an incredible guitarist from Louisville, Kentucky. We'll be back soon with more interviews. The next one features my colleague, trumpet player Herb Smith from the Rochester Philharmonic. So please go ahead and hit subscribe. <laughs>